All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Patrick Scully, I'm product manager at, uh, at Siena, and essentially I've uh, been invited here today to talk about um, assured networking and all right, <laughs> turn off the updates. And uh, essentially talk about uh, a number of things when we're talking about assured networking and what are the different elements in an assured networking environment. So we'll look at some of the, the threats, the market trends and data that we're seeing, uh, some of the elements about uh, what constitutes really an assured network. And we've heard some talks about the uh, cybersecurity in the earlier presentation. So we'll have a look at that. We'll have a look at some of the encryption solutions, some of the use cases of our encryption out there being deployed in, uh, in global environment, I have a look at the important details. So when we're talking about security and encryption, uh, the devil is always in the details. So we'll spend a bit more time talking about what those details are when we're talking about encryption. And we'll have a look at some of the uh, security examples and deployments examples about encryptions. Now when we're talking about some of these stories, uh, when we're talking about security, most of the customers that we talk to often don't want to be named publicly, but we do have a few customers that have accepted to be referenced, and I've got a couple of these use cases, just we can talk about it, but uh, most of the time, uh, if we're paying for security, if we're paying for encryption, uh, all that data has got to remain private. So when we're looking at uh, the assured networking concept, well, we're starting with the, the way that the information is evolving. Uh, and just many years ago, basically all the proprietary information was sent over constrained system. More and more, um, more devices are being put on the network. Information is being shared in a variety of uh, different environments. And at the same time, the value of the information that is going across those networks is increasing tremendously. Now, when I look at a chart, and the chart was put together a short while back, we're essentially looking at the evolutions. When I look at 2020, well, cloud services, software as a service, all the SDN um, talks that are happening today, well, 2020 is not that far away, uh, and to, to a large extent, we're essentially here today in terms of uh, the information and how information is being circulated around the network and exchanged between e either different entities within a company or uh, between corporations. At the same time as the amount of information being put out on the network is increasing, while well, the threats are increasing and we're at, we're like, let it, basically looking at securing the solutions, basically protecting uh, unauthorized access to networks and also protecting ourselves uh, from other elements as well. So when we're looking at the assured networking concept is not only looking at encrypting the data, which is one part of it, but also working with trusted suppliers. And we'll see what that means in the next chart. But it's all about having security of supply, making sure that the people and the partners that you're working with are reputable and have got everything that's needed to stand behind the solution. And also building a network that's reliable and resilient. So yes, your data can be fully protected. Well, if you can go, if it cannot go from point A to point B, well, the network is pretty much useless at that point. So be able to build a secure and reliable network, whether that's done with five nines or six nines of resiliency in network, all depends on the needs of the corporations. Now, when we're looking at the assured networking, uh, some call it pyramid, uh, basically similar to different stacks in a communication environment, but it starts at the very bottom with working with a trusted partner. And what that means, means different things to different people in terms of security of supply. So does your uh, vendor provide you with, or do they deal with multiple sources? For example, when we're dealing with a number of a components, we've got multiple source or one component. So in, in, in a case of um, some events that happened a couple of years ago with the, uh, the floods in Thailand and so forth, well, a number of manufacturing components were compromised for several months due to the flood. So working with multiple suppliers allows us to withstand those types of um, natural disasters that happen um, from time to time. At the same time, working with the, and designing a product from the ground up that's built for compliance, that built for certification, basically ensures that the network solutions that you'll deploy will be standards based and will be tested by third party to make sure that you don't have to rely necessarily on one partner or another, but industry standards to make sure that the solutions are fully um, compatible. 
at the same, same time, when we're going up the stack so we can look at data plane, which is what we'll talk about in terms of network level encryption today, but when looking at the other elements as well, whether it's at the control plane layer, whether it's at the mansion plane layer, so how do you monitor your network? How do you have a control plane that will help you meet those five nines or six nines of resiliency in a network by being able to redirect the traffic where it needs to be uh, when there's a failure happening in the network? And doing that in a secure environment where we build reliable as well as secure networks to offer both a network that's available and secure at the same time. So when we're looking at the different threats and why people look at deploying uh, encryption services and security services, a um, number of different aspects. So what are we looking at some of the laws and regulations? So as a corporation, whether you're in finance, whether you're in healthcare, there are a number of laws and policies that exist out there to which you've got to comply to in order to meet your obligation, not only to your end customers and to the states, but also to uh, your shareholders. So being able to protect that information in a growing threat environment is, uh, is increasingly important. At the same time, what are we talking about necessarily talking talking about compliance to laws and regulations, but also just protecting the brand. So when dealing with uh, financial institutions, the brand of that institution is quite important, and it's worth uh, a, lot, a lot more money than a threat could, uh, could be to. So quite often, it's about protecting the brand, protecting the reputation of the corporation that's at stake when we're dealing with uh, these kinds of threats. Now, information can be protected in many ways. Uh, of course, you can look at uh, all the server database security, so we're looking at firewalls, looking at uh, access control and so forth, which is one part of it. Um, you can encrypt the data with, when it's on hard drive, so we're looking at a hard drive on a laptop, so for if you've got someone that's in sales or someone that's in finance, well, the data is going to be encrypted so that if the laptop gets lost, at least information cannot be readily accessed. But at the same time, when we're looking at an interconnected web, of uh, different uh, offices and dealing with partners, we need to make sure that the data is also protected when it's going from point A to point B. Uh, and this is the focus of that discussion today, is really talking about how do we protect the data while it's in flight in a network. Now, a number of myths exist out there. I remember uh, meeting with a, uh, a large um, corporation here in, in Amsterdam a few, a few years ago. And the big myth about that system at that time was, well, yeah, it's a private network. It's a private optical fiber network. Therefore, my data is secure. And turning towards the service provider that was in a room with me at the time and said, well, all your manhole and access covers are welded tight, right? Uh, service provider looked around and said, well... No, it's pretty much freely accessible. So uh, one of the key things about it is that when we're looking at the transport technology being used, um, anyone nowadays can go on the web, purchase a fiber tap, clip that on a fiber, and be able to take a copy of the light that's coming up. And with the right detecting equipment, uh, you can essentially get all to all the data that's being, that's being transmitted on, on a fiber. Um, and when we're looking at uh, state-sponsored activity uh, the, and the means, so they definitely do have the means to do that, as well a number of um, crime syndicates out there where the financial means to do these kinds of attacks are definitely well within their means. Uh, when we're looking at the analysis as well, so as uh, computing power grows in the industry, be able to access the data and all the engines that exist to analyze the metadata does exist. So even if you're transmitting lots of data, uh, people can still filter down through the information that gets transmitted and uh, get access to it uh, at the same time. And the last point here, basically, we'll be able to detect it if someone uh, eavesdrops on our, uh, on our network. Well, yeah, if someone breaks a fiber, hooks it up to something else, you'll be able to detect the break, you'll be able to realize that. At the same time, if you just put a clamp on a fiber and there's a number of different technologies that exist out there today, um, even the most advanced OTDR system that detects uh, low level loss of light in a fiber due to a fiber band will not be able to detect those technologies. So even if, uh, if it's transmitted optically over uh, a fiber, uh, optical fiber network, it's still possible to tap the, the information. That's where being able to encrypt the data end-to-end -end is uh, quite important. Now, different ways of uh, deploying encryption services. Um, you can basically de deploy 
uh, at, or encrypt at the application layer. So that would mean that, well, if I've got Ethernet-based server, I can encrypt at the application layer. I can deploy a number of appliances. I can deploy different appliances depending on the type of traffic. So if I'm managing data centers, I've got Ethernet connectivity, I've got fiber, uh, fiber channel connectivity. I could have some uh, InfiniBand protocols as well. So if I want to encrypt all the traffic, I can do either do it at the application layer, which will be quite time consuming uh, and hard to manage and introduce lots of latency or network and end up with multiple devices to do the kind of encryptions that I need between my two data center. The other pro approach is basically being able to do it at the bulk or at the, uh, at the transport layer. So bring all the encryption uh, functions all the way from layer three, layer four, and higher, all the way to a layer one application that simplifies how the network uh, really works. It's at that point, you're dealing with a pro protocol agnostic encryption algorithm. So if I'm dealing with Ethernet, with fiber channel, or whatever types of application running on top of it, don't really care about the traffic that's being transmitted, it's just bits essentially that gets encrypted as they go through the network. What this also allows us to do is basically reduce the latency. If you're doing encryption at layer three or higher, uh, the amount of bandwidth that's being used or consumed for encryption management essentially reduces the overall throughput that's available to the application. Um, in the case of uh, layer three or IPsec encryptions, we're often talking 15, 20% bandwidth utilization for encryption management. As, and that's traffic bandwidth that's taken away from the application layer. So that's the aspect of it where we can essentially transmit the data at the wire rate speed and be able to do it with low latency. And I'll give you an example in one of the use cases later on where the latency aspect was uh, quite important. When we're looking at different ways of deploying the encryption solution, so a um, couple of ways we can look at it. One of it is, wrong button here. So essentially being deployed as an enterprise appliance. So an enterprise, let's say a large financial, could decide to deploy the encryption on their own um, and just use a circuit from service provider and be able to deploy and manage all the encryption solutions on themselves, uh, regardless of the application layer that's in, 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 in the middle. At the same time, you can deploy an encryption as a fully managed service, managed encryption service. What that means is that at the same time, we can reduce number of uh, devices in, in the network being able to do uh, the encryption. Uh, but the key aspect in both cases is that the security officer within the enterprise remains in control of all the critical security parameters. So when we're talking about authentication material, the frequency of key rotation, all that remains in control of the enterprise, whether it's deployed as an appliance, an encryption appliance, or whether it's deployed as part of a managed service. So being able to offer that separation of duty, even if I'm within an enterprise, I'm going to have a networking group, the IT group, I'm going to have my security group, so being able to offer that separation of duty between managing the network and the encryption devices and managing the critical security parameters by different people, different group is quite important. When looking at the different types of encryption solutions that, uh, that exist, uh, we can look either, and I'll go into details next chart about what each of those meant, but essentially looking at uh, gigabit Ethernet uh, encryptions where we can encrypt uh, gigabit Ethernet fiber channel services over any kind of MAN and one uh, architecture. And when we're looking at a 10 gig solutions, can encrypt a very t a variety of traffic types and be able to deploy that across different types of networks as well. So I'll give you a couple of examples over the next couple of charts. The first one really is about being able to encrypt gigabit Ethernet or one gig fiber channel services over any type of environment. So uh, the key aspect here is to be able to take gigabit, uh, gigabit Ethernet services, fiber channel, one gig services compress them if you wish. So uh, the same uh, device that performs the encryption also has a pretty effective uh, compression engine. So we, we can get uh, two to one, three to one quite easily up to eight to one uh, services depending on the traffic that's going through. Uh, but you can effectively compress that traffic, encrypt it with an AES-256 encryption algorithm and transmit that over an unsecured network, whether that's a private line service, whether that's a dedicated service, uh, whether it's going across an IP MPLS cloud, we can effectively take the gigabit Ethernet traffic, compress it, encrypt it, and transmit it across 
a fully secure network, guaranteeing that the information is secured as it enters the network all the way till it leaves the network at the other end, regardless of uh, what's in between. The uh, next is about uh, talking about uh, 10 gig encryption, and we can look at it in a different, uh, different form factor. Um, one of them is uh, being able to encrypt over existing links. So if you're dealing with uh, links that are provided by a service provider, whether you've got an existing uh, SEH64 or SCM64 network, or whether you're getting a leased uh, OTN line from a service provider, we can effectively uh, take a 10 gigi LAN file traffic, encrypt it, and transmit it over an existing SEH network. Or we can do the same by encrypting pretty much any type of traffic and be able to bulk encrypt it and transmit it across a, a standard switch OTN infrastructure. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with OTN technology, SDH technology, uh, but essentially when we're looking at existing networks today, a lot of circuits that have been deployed over the past uh, 15, 20 years were pretty much all based on SDH technology. So a number of circuits, whether it's SCM1, SCM4, SCM16, and so forth, have been deployed. So if we're deploying uh, services over existing infrastructure, we can leverage what's already in the ground without having necessarily to reinvent the wheel and use uh, different types of circuit. At the same time, OTN technology uh, is what service providers have been investing on over the last uh, several years, and that's where we're seeing the emergence of OTU2 circuits in addition to STM64 circuits from service provider, and effectively can aggregate any of these signals and transmit that encrypted over these kinds of networks. The other aspect is uh, essentially uh, being able to do that over whether it's private network or whether it's a um, overall uh, infrastructure that's built over a secure network is again being able to take any of the services, mux them together, aggregate them onto a platform and be able to transmit that either as a wavelength or as a managed service into the network. So a number of ways that the uh, devices can be deployed to take the traffic, encrypt it, transmit it fully secure across a number of different network architectures. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when uh, we're talking about uh, encryption services and security, uh, devil's often in the details. So a number of uh, vendors out there offer security or encryption solution. Uh, and when comparing different solutions, it's quite important to look at the details because that's where uh, the difference, uh, the, the key differences are. Uh, and that can point out to different vulnerabilities of one solutions versus another. So when analyzing these kinds of solutions, it's important to look at the details. I've Group them into uh, a few categories here uh, just for um, uh, discussion purposes. Uh, probably a few more that could have been added, but the first one is really talking about authentication. Really, when we're looking at uh, competing encryption solution, uh, quite often the materials that you use to authenticate can either be uh, a pre shared key, so passwords that you enter at both ends of the network uh, that someone's got to remember uh, if they want to change it later on. Um, or more often what we're seeing in, uh, in our solution is support of standardized certificates. So most enterprises today have a PKI infrastructure of uh, different sort. Um, uh, for example, on my work laptop, we've got the certificates that authenticate me when I connect to a network to your VPN. So all these infrastructure already exist in most enterprises today. So be able to leverage that kind of infrastructure for encryption devices simplifies the management of the authentication material um, and allows us to uh, more um, to ease the operational aspect of encryption in a network as opposed to having to manage different passwords and uh, so forth across devices. The other aspect of it about uh, authentication is being able to have an authentication service that's decoupled from the uh, data encryption itself. So quite often what we'll see in uh, traditional encryption appliances is that we'll enter, let's say, a pre-shared key to authenticate the devices at both ends of the network. 
and then the encryption keys, the keys that are used to actually encrypt the traffic, are derived from that same PSK, that same pre passphrase. So when we're looking at vulnerabilities in the system, be able to have an authentication system that's totally separate from the data encryption portion is quite important to increase the security as opposed to having one key that can unlock both the data and the authentication. Um, having it separate increases the security in, in the network. The other aspect is uh, all about uh, encryption. So when you're building a network, well, you want something that's networkable, that's not a point solution. So being able to have a solution that is both secure and networkable is quite important uh, when we're looking at uh, building larger networks. Now, from a secure perspective, not having the ability to disable the encryption services on the encryption appliance is quite important. Um, there are a number of different solutions that exist out there where you can either turn on or off encryption on demand. Well, that relies on human action to turn it back on if you disable it for maintenance and so forth. So a number of uh, different uh, attack points in the network if you can actually disable that. Our solution essentially come on with one mode and one mode only, which is encryption is always enabled. There's no way to disable it. So removes that security all completely and leaves it to the side, even with a solution that's fully man manageable across the network. The other aspect about secure solution is, yeah, AES-256 is a standard that's uh, used in the enterprise for encryption services today. Uh, the operational aspect of it is being able to rotate the keys that are used to encrypt traffic on a regular basis. So even if I have access to mainframe supercomputers to try to break the AES-256 key, um, if I change the key every minute in a network, oh, and by the way, we're also looking at changing minutes to seconds in, uh, in our next uh, evolution, but right now our solution are changing those keys dynamically with no impact to traffic throughput and no impact to the network latency, and they're doing that every minute. So that just increases uh, the uh, solution, the security solutions where the keys that are used to actually encrypt the traffic are rotated every 60 seconds um, without the user uh, intervention. And the last part is uh, certification. So um, most of the time, uh, if you're deploying uh, enterprise or data center solutions, you'll want the solutions to be certified with Brocade or EMC or whatever partner you're using in the uh, data center. Well, at the same time, same goes with uh, encryption. So being able to offer a validated encryptions Yes, we've got very good software programmers. Are they fully fledged mathematician that can come up with encryption solutions? Well, maybe, but I'll rather trust something that's been developed over the years as a proven uh, encryption algorithm. And we're having a third party validate that, not by having access to our codes and so forth. Uh, this is still our proprietary information, the implementation, but being able to attest that it is a valid implementation of an AES-256 encryption protocol is quite important to reassure uh, the uh, CIOs in the world to be able to offer encryption services. And uh, as I mentioned, so in the case of uh, being able to build secure network that are easy to manage, you'll be able to integrate into existing PKI infrastructure, into existing enterprise PKI infrastructure, simplifies the management of the devices and network. So as opposed to relying on someone remembering the, uh, the passphrase to authenticate number of devices in network, and right now that's pretty simple point-to-point -point, uh, communication systems between, let's say, two dis data centers. But if you're managing offices globally with uh, hundreds, of, uh, hundreds of different offices or under different devices, remembering and uh, managing those passphrases on an ongoing basis is quite cumbersome, especially if your security policy mandates that you change those authentication parameter every three months or every six months, depending on, on the enterprise. So be able to do that with, with a fully automated uh, way through a, a certificate, central certificate authority server and be able to do that and be able to revoke certificate and be able to import new certificate when the old one expires and so forth um, simplifies the operational aspect of deploying an encryption solution. 
Uh, so that, that's definitely one of the aspects that our solutions that offer is fully integration with existing infrastructure. And we've got a number of dip, uh, networks that have been deployed globally, whether it's with an RSA infrastructure, whether it's uh, with an Entrust infrastructure, uh, essentially all common infrastructure that meets the X509 uh, certificate standards. And the other aspect is um, being able to independently manage uh, authentication parameters in a network. So as I mentioned, whether I'm dealing with a single enterprise that's got an IT division and a security division, or whether I'm dealing with a solution that's managed by a service provider or partner, uh, the important thing is, is that the information security officer remains in control of the authentication material, the critical security parameters, uh, and that is shielded from the network operator, whether the IT department of the service provider. So being able to offer that separation of duty is critical to the deployment and manageability of an encryption solution. No. Bit technical details here. I won't go into uh, too much details, but that's just a, a quick view as to the encryption process that are used in, in our solution. Um, and it's all about to say that basically when we get the signal coming in into our platform, whether it's a SEH signal, whether it's 10 gigabit Ethernet, whether it's a fiber channel signal, what we do is we take that entire signal. So if it's, particularly in the case of Ethernet services, we don't care about uh, the, the preamble, we don't care about the, uh, the MAC addresses, whether it's the originating address or the destination address. The entire signal gets mapped into, um, into the OPM frame, into an OPU2 payload. So this is essentially the transport envelope that is used to transport uh, the data across the network. So the entire client signal is then mapped into this uh, payload envelope. And when we're looking at the standard OTN frame, we're looking at doing forward error corrections or all the overhead that are used to manage the network, uh, manage the signal as it goes through the network, is left essentially in the clear. So when we encrypt the traffic, we encrypt the payload and the payload only so that the data that matters to the end user, to the enterprise, whether it's the 10 gig of fiber channels, is completely, uh, completely encrypted uh, and safe from prior eyes. And at the same time, all the other parameters that are used to manage the network, regenerate the signal as it goes through, uh, let's say, a long home network, are left in the clear so that we can take that signal and have a networkable solution. So whether we need to take a 10 gig and get it from uh, New York to London to Amsterdam, uh, the signal needs to be regenerated along the way, or if we need to concatenate that signal with other 10 gigabits Ethernet signal um, into a 40G or 100G architecture, we can do that with a networkable solution that's not constrained necessarily to uh, CNF products. And I'll cover that in, in, uh, in a short while, but that essentially allows us to traverse a variety of network whether it's our own equipment or not, of course, we'd always prefer that be our gear uh, underneath, but at the same time, we're fairly agnostics and standards compliant that, so that that type of signal can be regenerated on third-party networks as well. So a couple of examples, and that last bit about uh, being able to deploy across different time, uh, kinds of network plays well with that uh, first use case. So this is an example of um, Barclays card. So Barclay, um, essentially a large uh, multinational uh, financial institutions, they do a lot of uh, work with credit cards and store credit cards in, in the U.S., um, and they add three different data centers that they wanted to interconnect for their 10 gigabit Ethernet links. Um, and these were deployed over uh, links that were managed by a service provider. Now, a service provider at the time was not able to offer them managed encryption solutions, so they turned over to us and say, well, I've got these two links. One of them is an actual OTN link, so it's an OT2, uh, OT2 link in between my data center in Delaware, another one in uh, New Jersey. However, my other network that's deployed on another vendor's uh, equipment is only capable of a sonnet link. So it's an OC192 uh, equivalent to an STM64. Uh, so we've got this existing network, and really we'd like to be able to deploy an encryption solution over these existing links so that we don't have to go and reinvent and go negotiate new deals with our uh, service provider. 
So what we did was essentially deploying our encryption solution. One of the link was essentially taking a 10 gigabit Ethernet, mapping it as a wavelength or an OTN wave across the existing bottom network. And the top link was essentially taking a 10, giga, 10 gigabit Ethernet, slightly subrated because a sonnet payload is uh, less than the, the full payload of a 10 gigabit Ethernet, but still being able to leverage that existing OCO line 2 link in between those two data centers. Um, and the critical aspect of it was be able to do that with no network deg deg degradation. So since they're dealing with credit card transla uh, transaction, latency is quite important. So being able to do it with very low latency was very important to, uh, to that customer. And be able to use, um, and that's one of the examples where they add their own existing PKI infrastructure. They wanted the solution to integrate with their existing infrastructure, and that's essentially what we've deployed day one, uh, integrating into that uh, existing enterprise uh, built uh, PKI infrastructure. The other example, a um, bit closer to, uh, to here, uh, it's um, it's a, uh, an enterprise here in Europe. I unfortunately can't name that uh, specific enterprise, but as a use case, um, the key part of it is that they already had an existing network and it was built on our CNA equipment, um, but they were using third-party encryptor devices for their 10 gigabit Ethernet services. And the key aspect is that even though it was a fairly small network, we're talking about a, a metropolitan environment about 10 to 20 kilometers away um, on the short path and long path, um, the application layers kept timing out, so they were using a layer two based encryption solution. And the latency that was introduced by uh, that encryption solution was such that the application kept clogging between the working and the protection link because uh, the application layer couldn't tolerate the increased latency in a network. So in that case, we simply removed those encryption appliances uh, from the network deploy the encryption solution to the existing uh, equipment that they had on site and be able to uh, do the encryption within, micro uh, within microseconds as opposed to millisecond really change the network dynamics and all the timeouts at the application layer went away and that network's been in the ground I think for the last three years um, it's been running uh, happily for the last three years uh, so that's just one example where latency does matter at the application layer and be able to offer a protocol agnostic low latency solution uh, is, uh, is quite important. Um, the other customer that uh, we can briefly talk about, and it's one of those dots on the map, uh, generally because we can speak specific names uh, in, uh, in the encryption industry, the best I can do is show you approximately where uh, our encryption uh, solutions are deployed. So we've got fairly large concentration uh, here in, uh, in Europe, in different parts of, uh, of Europe. But one of the, uh, these dots is the, the Bank of England. So I don't have any charts on it, uh, but it's a customer that has accepted to uh, be referenced publicly as well. Uh, so we're doing quite a bit of work with financial institutions, with uh, different government agency, whether it's, it's um, uh, public or military agencies as well, and be able to offer secure solution across a vast array of uh, enterprise uh, services. And with that, I'll probably just uh, turn it over to uh, questions. I think time-wise, uh, not doing too bad. Any questions? Or? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, My pleasure.